Hey, he's a... Come, 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 come. You gotta leave? Okay, yeah. we'll see you later or see you tomorrow? Tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow. Okay, you be a good boy, okay? Inshallah. I'll show you something cool tomorrow again, okay? Inshallah, all right? Allah bless you. Oh, you mean in the car? That's right. Perfect. 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 Inshallah. Together. Inshallah. Inshallah. You got it. You got it. Wanna hold the mic up or that's fine. Um, do they have questions? Do the sisters have questions? Are there any questions that the sisters have? If there are, please prepare them now. Yeah. And put them on the paper now. Yeah. Maybe we can do a quick, simple reminder and do more Q and A. Looking after their needs. Yeah, I need they always. You know, if they have any questions, please write them down on paper. Ready? Yeah. Okay. We're live, we're ready? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathiran. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. With regards to Ramadan, the month of fasting, praying, feeding, serving, and donating, and the Muslim woman. Then before we say what we wish to say here today, please go back to a few lectures that we've done on the topic specifically, and a few lectures and talks that we have done on women's issues specifically and generally. Talks that we've done on women in the month of Ramadan and talks that we have done on things that are specific and exclusive to women or pointing out issues, giving time and attention and service to the needs of women in our Islam. From those lectures, as a talk that we did maybe two and a half years ago in Masjid Al Ansar, New York City, it was a conference called of fasting 
fiqh of fasting. Disciples of Hadith, fiqh of fasting. There's a playlist on our channel, Hadith Disciple, on YouTube. The last link, the last talk of the playlist, I devoted just to women's fiqh issues. Women's fiqh issues pertaining to the month of Ramadan. I have many questions which are reoccurring and are always or oftentimes asked with regards to women when they have to fast and have to make up fast and childbirth and breastfeeding and pain the expiation and so on and so forth. So go back to that. That's first and foremost. Secondly, a few months back, we were in Malaysia at Nottingham University. We did a talk on the Muslim woman in light of 2019. In light of the modern times and the modern age, some of the challenges, some of the obstacles, some of the proper understandings and improper understandings of the Muslim woman in Islam and light of the Sharia. Please go back to that lecture as well. Also, the lecture that we just did in Stockton, California, with regards to feminism in Islam, is feminism supported by Islam? Is feminism haram in Islam? What is the proper understanding and proper position of that term, of that word, and of that concept in light of Al-Islam? Very beneficial lecture, but even in Ayatollah, with regards to the things that are specific to a woman and the things which aren't specific to a woman. So those are just three lectures. Uh, we've done many other lectures with regards to advice to disciples of Hadith. You can type that in. You can find that as well. Dis advice to all disciples. Uh, advice to the disciples of London and we've done many many talks and lectures in which we have spoken on the specific rulings specific advices and specific points of discussion of debate and of reflection with regards to al maratul muslima the muslim woman in ramadan and outside of ramadan so to maximize time and to economize energy it's no need in us repeating those things over and over again, especially when we're on uh, a foreign tour, going from masjid to masjid, center to center, in which time and energy is even more compromised. So please go back to those lectures, and inshallah, you'll find all that you uh, wish to find, and that which is not there, you can ask about and request for more. Wabillahi tawfiq. As far as some of the pieces of advice or the points that I would give to you now, or fiqh rulings or things like this with regards to the month of Ramadan, then right now at this point, I can't think of anything specific just to women. Anything, any piece of advice that I wouldn't give to a man. Now, when we were coming in the musalla here, we were waiting to make wudu, to offer salat al asr, and the brother, he asked us, he says, the talk will be for an hour. He says, you're going to speak for an hour or 30 minutes. How long are you going to speak for? I said, I don't know. I haven't spoken yet. How do I know how long the talk is going to be? And I didn't talk yet. That's unseen. That's the qadr. We don't know what's going to happen. How long do I plan to speak? It's a different story. My intention to speak. But how long am I speaking for? Allah can take my life. Anything can happen or take place. Allah knows best how long things will last. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is I don't have anything specifically prepared that I will say to a sister that I wouldn't say to a brother. It's a very important point that we made when we were at Nottingham University in Malaysia about the Messenger of Allah's words in the Manisa'u Shaqa'iq Rijal. That women are the twins of men. Women are nothing more than the twins of men. The rules that apply to men are the rules that apply to women. And also the pieces of advice that apply to men are the pieces of advice that apply to women. And one of the greatest pieces of advice and one of the most important pieces of nasiha that we have to give to ourselves and to the, to the brothers and also to you, the sisters, is what Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ taqwa. Outfit yourselves, prepare yourselves, pack Take the necessary provisions with you on your trip and on your journey. And the best taqwa or the best zad, the best provision is taqwa. What is awadu? When it comes to making hajj, prepare yourselves. Outfit yourselves. When it comes to Ramadan, 
when it comes to living as a Muslim woman in Birmingham in 2019, prepare yourself, gear up. And the best gearing up is the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's my first piece of advice. Allah also says, وَلَقَدْ وَصَيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ And it took Allah. Indeed, the advice that we gave to the Jews and the Christians and the other nations, the other communities that came before you, is to have fear of me. وَلَقَدْ وَصَيْنَا الَّذِينَ Allah says, indeed, we have given them taqwa. And that's the advice that we give to you as well. And there are many ayats in the Qur'an al kareem which oblige upon us all to have his taqwa and to give the advice to each other to have the taqwa. As Allah, the Most High and the Exalted says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa al-Asr, inna al-insana la fi khusr, illa al-ladhina amanu wa aminu salihat, wa tawasaw bil-haq, wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Allah says, by time, by al-Asr, Allah swears by the most valuable gift that he has handed man. By time, all men and all women will be in utter loss except for those who have the following four qualities. Al-Iman, Al-Amal Salih, righteous deeds, and they advise each other with the haq. And what could be more truthful than taqwa? What could be more truthful than someone giving you the advice of having the taqwa of Allah and they advise each other with having perseverance, without lasting, remaining, after everyone falls out and passes out and dies off, they remain, they have, they have sabr. They are patiently persevering. So the advice that I give to the sisters now, first and foremost, is no different than the advice that I give to the brothers, and that's to have taqwa. That's to have taqwa. And that's based off of <laughs> Women are nothing more than the twins of men. The second piece of advice that I give to myself and to the Muslim woman, with regards to the month of Ramadan, with regards to Shaban, with regards to Shawwal, is the advice to seek knowledge. The advice to gain beneficial knowledge. The advice al fi is to get the knowledge and the deen of Al Islam. Knowledge is power. Knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone, as we say, huh? In New York City. The Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and so many beautiful ahadith has encouraged his companions, male and female, to seek knowledge. And we all know the ayat in the Quran al Karim about the virtue of seeking knowledge and the beauty of those who possess that knowledge. And Allah Azza wa clearly mandates, He clearly establishes that men of understanding, men of wisdom, men of intellect, men of knowledge and science are not equal to men of ignorance and heedlessness. They are not the same, they're not created equal. Those who have ilm and fiqh and faham are not equal to those who lack those things. Allah says, النَّاسِ And those are the parables and the similitudes and the examples that we make for men. No one can understand them, grasp them, and benefit from them except people who have aql, people who have strong, powerful minds. Strong and powerful minds. So we have so many ayats in the Quran al Kareem that explain to us the virtue of knowledge, the superiority of knowledge. And this is for men, and this is for women. But from the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, will shed specific light on the fact of women seeking knowledge and learning and getting fiqh in the deen, is the famous narration of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri in Sahih Bukhari, in which one day the women went to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, not praising the Messenger of Allah, or asking him a question, but they went to him complaining, to make a complaint. And they made the complaint which was direct and blunt. They said, Ya Rasulullah, ghalabana alayka rijal. He says, O Messenger of Allah, the men have taken over you. The men have monopolized you. The men are the only ones who have access to you. We have no time, no attention, no special teaching from you because there's so many Sahaba. You're always in their company. You're always in the company of the Sahaba. As is mentioned in certain narrations with regards to some of the differences between some of the Sahaba with regards to the things that Aisha saw, the things that Aisha encountered, and the things that the other companions encountered, such as the narration that states that Aisha has said that whoever says 
that the Messenger of Allah والسلام, relieved himself standing. He urinated standing. Do not believe him. Don't believe him. It's a lie. If anyone says that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, did that, that he urinated while standing. And we know that Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, Sahih Bukhari, clearly affirmed that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, وسلم, He urinated standing up. And as if it states in certain narrations, how could Aisha clearly negate the fact and Hudayfa and his companion and so on and so forth. And it was said, maybe this was one of the times in which you weren't with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In which you were adorning yourself and beautifying yourself as a housewife. And we were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you can't say what he never did. You weren't with him all the time like the men were with him all of the time. So back to the other narration. They said, They said, the men have taken over you, O Messenger of Allah. فَجَعَلْنَا يَوْمًا مِنْ نَفْسِكَ He said, so give us a specific day, a special time, a special class, in which you will تُعَلِّمُنَا مِمَّا عَلَّمَكَ الله. From that which Allah has taught you. Give us some of the benefit that Allah has given you. So the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, he promised them. He gave them a mawid. He made an appointment and an arrangement to teach them. And when he went to those women, from that which he said to those women, he says, مَا مِنْ كُنِّ مُرَعْتٌ تُقَدِّمُ ثَلَثَةٍ مِنْ وَلَدِهَا إِلَّا كَانَ نَاهِ جَمَا مِنَ نَارِ He says, any woman who has three miscarriages, three abortions, quote-unquote. Some countries, a miscarriage is called an abortion. In America, we only use the word abortion when you intentionally take the child's life. But in actual English, the word abortion and miscarriage are oftentimes synonymous in English. Al-Muhim, we don't want no one to misunderstand in America. In America, we only use that word to mean clinically taking the child's life. And I remember this when I was in Medina, okay? Uh, and we were discussing things with the doctor with regards to one of my daughters being born. And they were asking certain questions and certain concerns. There were complications. And they mentioned about the concept of abortion. I was like, what are you talking about? My wife is eight months pregnant. What are you talking about? Abortion, so on and so forth. And that's not, huh? Well, we understood what they were saying. Al-Muhim, he says, مَا مِنْ كُنِّ مْرَاتٌ تُقَدِّمُ ثَلَاثَةً مِنْ وَرَدِهَا إِلَّا كَانَ لَهَا حِجَابًا مِنَ نَارِ He says, any woman who loses three children, who has a miscarriage three times, will be protected from hellfire. Will be protected from the hellfire. And he asked the question, he says, what about two children? Huh? وَثْنَتَيْنْ or وَثْنَيْنْ What about two? And he said, even two children, even two children. So this authentic hadith shows us that Prophet Muhammad had a great deal of concern and care for both sexes learning, but women learning exclusively and specifically. Also when the Messenger of Allah did the Eid, and he gave them the khutbah, after he finished speaking to both the men and the women, him and Bilal walked to the women. He approached them and he gave them advice to give sadaqah and to protect themselves from the hellfire with sadaqah. And Bilal radiallahu anhu spread out his garment and he took off the earrings and he threw their uh, anklets or bracelets or pieces of jewelry and Bilal, he collected their sadaqah. And in many other hadith in which the Messenger of Allah والسلام, encouraged both sexes to learn and to study and he gave specific advice to the women of al-Islam. And the countless hadith in which Aisha radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet some questions and uh, quote-unquote debating with the Prophet initially. She asked him a question, she went back and forth. How is this? How is the hisab? Manuqish al-hisab udhib. Huh? Inna ma dalika al-arq. Okay? And which Aisha asked the Prophet about Quranic verses. And there are many, many other hadith with regards to the uh, advice of giving or uh, learning fiqh and studying in the deen for men and for women, and also exclusively for women. Piece of advice number three. Uh, with regards to men and women is preservation of time and time management and they aren't the same to preserve your time is one thing and to manage your time is another you can be the most responsible person with your time but you waste it in things which are not beneficial things which are not fruitful in the deen or the dunya or you could preserve your time you only do the permissible things the recommended things the good things in Islam but you don't manage it properly it's out of control. 
how much time to study, how much time to work, how much time for my family, my husband, my children, sleep, eat, drink, etc. So the concept of time and the preciousness of time. Time is the most valuable thing. And that is why Allah Azza wa swore by that thing. Well, also, he swore by time because it's that valuable to show us the importance of that thing. So my advice to these sisters is to be mindful of your time. And sisters, they complain that we don't have classes. And the brothers are the only ones who see the shape. And the men have more opportunity to study. And Medina is the only place which they accept the men and so on and so on and so on and so forth. How much time is spent gossiping? How much time is spent backbiting? How many lectures have I been to in which the sisters are talking? They're yapping as I speak. Just a couple minutes ago, we heard voices. No, that's not management of time. That's not preservation of time. You make an excuse saying that only the men have the, op the opportunity to study, but sisters, they talk at lectures. They backbite, they gossip. They spend so much time watching this and flipping through this magazine and talking about it and so on and so on and so forth. And you don't even realize those minutes turn into hours and those hours turn into days, days turn into weeks, weeks into months, into years. And you've lost a great chunk of time, which could have been used studying and memorizing and reviewing and catching up with the brother who's supposedly ahead of you, let alone surpassing them. And that's management of time and being mindful of your time. No matter what situation you're in, it's to be mindful of your time. And when sisters, they complain about studying, but they don't study that much, then they get married, they get pregnant, they have children, where do their studies go? How much time do you have now when you have to wake up in the middle of the night to feed the baby, to change the diapers, to the baby or the child is running around them, you don't have time to sit down and study anymore. So take advantage of the time while you have it. That's advice for brothers, and for sisters as well. The next piece of advice, which isn't specific to sisters, is to take advantage of every situation and not speaking about time exclusively. If you have to cook, if you have to clean, if you're married, if you're a housewife, if you work, if you go outside the house, whatever your lifestyle is, there's always a situation and occasion to be exploited. And that is through the technology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. You have AirPods, you have earbuds, you have wireless Bluetooth, in which you're cooking and cleaning and washing and sweeping, and you can be listening to the lecture of one of the ulama. You can be listening to Sahih Bukhari. The whole entire Sahih Bukhari is on YouTube for free. The whole entire Sahih Bukhari is on archive.org. If YouTube is a haram, haram Abu Sayyid, you can't listen to YouTube or you can't go onto YouTube, there are images there, it's, it's haram, to, okay, type, love us. You can listen to the audio and wish, inshallah, there are no images on archive.org. Sunnah Abi Dawood, Jami Tirmidhi, Nasai, Ibn Majah, Kutub Sitta, Muatamak. You can listen to them in the comfort of your own home. And your husband, he may have to go outside and work. He may be at a rail yard for 10 hours working, 12 hours working. And you can be in the comfort of your home, dressed in your comfortable clothes, listening and studying to the books of Hadith. So take advantage of every situation. There's no reason why when you're cooking and preparing for the Ramadan that you're not reviewing, making murajah and listening to a beneficial lecture, but not just beneficial lectures. And there's nothing wrong with beneficial lectures. I myself am a lecturer, but you need to sit down and actually listen to Sahih Bukhari. Sit down and listen to it. No explanation, no sharh, no hift. Just listen to it. And be the night to make it your goal to finish Sahih Bukhari at least once in your lifetime. Make it your goal to finish Bulug Muram once a week, once a month. To finish 40 hadith once a day. How many hours does it take? Okay? So anything that you do in the house, outside the house, take advantage of it. Always take advantage of the occasion. And I remember when I was younger, and I was in Yemen, I was in the basement in the library, in one of the masjids in Sana'a, and I was reading about some of the Salaf al-Salih. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was Al-Amash, a famous narrator of hadith, and it was said about him, that whenever the people saw him, they always saw a book with him. They never saw him without a book. They never saw him without a book. And from that day, I made it my earnest efforts to always have a piece of reading material on me. And I'm not saying it's bragging or boasting, but people who know me, my friends who know me know that if you catch Mufti in the streets, you're gonna catch him with at least what? At least one book on him. A pocket book, a journal, he said, said a diary, something, whatever the book is on, but you're not going to catch him what? Void of some type of piece of reading material. And the worst punishment 
is when you're in the airport and they're searching through your stuff, they're holding you up and they won't allow you to read the book even for five minutes. Well, why? It's discomfort. And just the other day, we asked the guy in TSA, I said, listen, can you do me a favor? He said, yeah. I said, can you please just check my book, swipe it, put it through the metal detector, see what chemical bombs is on the book, please, first, so I can read it while you go through the rest of my bag. Am I making this up? I'm saying to take advantage of time and to take advantage of every occasion. There's no excuse. And as one of my students said a few years ago in an election that we did called The Golden Legacy, he said, ignorance in 2017 is a choice. Ignorance in 2017 is a choice. It's a choice. It's an option. This was two years ago. Back in the day, you couldn't necessarily say that if you were a housewife. If your husband refused for you to go to the, the circles of a vicar in Eden, don't leave the house. If you were a slave or a servant, a peasant. If you were a person who had to work a farm for 20 hours a day, 18 hours a day. It was on time to study and to benefit and read and do these things. If you were prevented from reading, you didn't have the ability to finish school. Or you were prevented from reading because you were a slave. Or whatever the case may be. He said in 2017, ignorance is a what? It's a choice. You have the ability and the option to learn and to study and to maximize your time. Put in your headphones, vacuum the floor. Put in your headphones, wash the dishes. Put in your headphones, change your child's diaper. If you're married, if you're a housewife, if you're a homemaker. So take advantage of your time. And what Lloyd is the advice that we've given to the brothers over the years. Stop playing around. Stop laughing. Stop joking. Read the book. Go overseas. Don't ask no questions how to go to Medina. Just go to Medina. And that is why we said to many brothers when they say, I got it, I got it, uh, I got it accepted to the university. And I'll say, okay, great. What do you want me to do? Clap my hands? Am I supposed to congratulate and celebrate you? No. And they say, well, what do you mean? What advice do you give me? I say, you'll fail. You're not going to go to Medina. And if you do, you're going to quit. We said this at the Hickman Center last year to a brother. And they said, how can you be so harsh, Mufti, so on and so forth? I'm trying to push him. Is that the statistics of the people who go and study and finish are very slim. And I've seen too many brothers come and go and they don't want to take the advice. They don't want to take the advice. And they think that seeking knowledge is a silver platter or better roses. It takes great sacrifice and a lot of hardships that you must encounter. As Ibn Umar radiallahu anhum has said, tell the student of knowledge to get a pair of iron sandals. Tell the student of knowledge to get a pair of iron sandals. That's how much supper you'll need. And the people who make it, very, very, very few. And one of the reasons why they don't make it is that they don't like taking the advice of those who came before them. And when we went to Medina, we took the advice of those who came before us and we discarded the bad advice. The stuff that didn't make sense and wasn't true, we threw that in the rubbish bin. The rubbish bin. Wallahi. But the good stuff, we took it and we stole it. And we built upon it and we created our own. Alhamdulillah. But well, we benefited from their suffering. And we benefited from their mistakes and their errors. We learned from it. So you have to take advantage of the opportunity that Allah has given you with regards to seeking knowledge. With regards to seeking knowledge. A next piece of advice that I give that is specific to women is to make sure that you learn, you study, you revise, and you inquire about the specific issues of fiqh of Ramadan and fiqh of fasting with regards to the opposite sex. You must study the things that pertain to you. And you cannot allow someone to teach them to you. You cannot allow someone to give you that knowledge because humans are stingy. Humans are stingy. Humans are oppressive by nature. And oftentimes, and the truth is going to be said, many men will refuse to teach women what they need to know to continue to dominate them and to control them. And the moment you have to come to me and ask the question, there's a level of power that I have over you. If I'm an oppressive husband, or if I'm a chauvinistic father, or whatever word or term you wish to use, I have all of the knowledge because knowledge is only for men, as we said, right? They said in the time of what? The Prophet of Islam. They said that the pro in the time of the Prophet of Islam, the men have taken over you. What about 2019? Huh? What would the women say? What? In 2019. But oftentimes, it's your fault. And that's because you allow the keys to the door to be in the hands of one custodian and one janitor. Make a copy of the keys yourself. Make a copy of the keys yourself. You learn and study the specific rulings. That way no one can dominate and dictate to you what it is or what it isn't. And oftentimes the thick opinions are wrong and they're incorrect to suit their desires. 
So, can a woman come make i'tikaf in the masjid? Or she has to make i'tikaf in her house. And the best place for a woman to pray is her home. That's the only narration that you'll hear from your husband who wants you just to stay home. And you actually read and study and you may discover different athar and different hadith. And he cannot no longer dominate and control you and say, you have to stay here, you have to do this, so on and so forth. Based off of what? Kitab and sunnah, ijma, Or your desires and your whims. You understand this? When it comes to a woman who's a widow, a woman whose husband has died, and she has to wait for months and ten days, can she leave her home at nighttime and make tarawih? Or can she only leave her home in the daytime? It's a masala faqiyya. And you find many fuqaha saying that she's not allowed to leave the house at night. What's the proof for that? What's the delay from the authentic sunnah for that? There is none. So if you don't know the, the issue, if you haven't studied the fiqh, then you'll be stuck to one fatwa. And you'll be upon that person his way. The, a woman who has uh, al-istihada, who has irregular bleeding, continuous menstruation, which isn't the normal menstruation, can she come and make it to calf? Can she make... Uh, tarawih. Or can, uh, can she come into the masjid? Can she make, can she make tarawih? Perfect example. Do you need to be pure to make it a Can a menstruated woman make it a or not? Obviously, the famous issues with regards to missed days in Ramadan, breastfeeding. Do I have to make up the days and feed a poor person? Just feed a poor person? Just make up the days? Or do I have to do nothing? Al qada and al it'am. Al qada, be doing al it'am. Which one? What's the correct view from among the ulama of Al Islam? Can a menstruating woman listen to the Quran? Can she read the Quran herself? Can she make supplications that have Quranic verses therein? Can she touch the Mus'haf, the Quran? It's an issue pertaining to women that you have to study. Can a woman spend money that's her money without her husband's permission? Does she need Ibn Zoj? to give sadaqah from her wealth? Or, even deeper than that, can she give sadaqah from her husband's wealth without her husband's permission? Masala fiqiyya. Hmm? That's a fiqh issue. That's a fiqh issue. And there are many, many what? More fiqh issues like this. So ask yourself the question now. Do you want to leave these fiqh issues in the hands of someone who is one-sided? Or would you like to leave these fiqh issues in the hands of the Salaf of Salih, the ulama of Islam who came and they died? They have no partiality or biasness. Which of the two, Abu Isa? If it was me, I would definitely want to leave it in their hands. This is what the ulama say. This is what Shaf he said. This is what Ibrahim and Nakhai did. So on and so forth. And not leave it in the hands of someone who may only give you half of the narrative to suit his desires. So now all people who have that power know this. They know that knowledge is power. And this is the reason behind the southern slaves in the United States, they weren't allowed to read. They knew that those slaves that they had were just as human as they were. They, they knew this. They were just as human as they were. Their skulls, their brains were no different than theirs. They knew this. They had a folly of science and biology and things like this, which made no sense. These things, were, these theories are only made to, uh, to, 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 to soothe the guilt of hypocrisy. It's proven by science that we're superior to them and they're inferior. It's, it's proven. That's why they don't need to read. They knew that was a lie. And the proof that that was a lie is that they prevented them from reading. And any slave that was caught reading or learning someone else to read was severely punished. So if they're physically, mentally, spiritually inferior, and they're incapable of learning and being civil and so on and so forth. Why do you have to prevent them from reading if they can't do it anyhow? Because they knew that it wasn't true. And then they knew if that they started reading things and getting knowledge and getting power and getting science, there would be serious problems. And from those problems is that perhaps they would read about where they came from and that they weren't swinging from trees in Africa. And then they came from dynasties and kingdoms and great civilizations where many people in Europe weren't living like that. Nations well, many people in Europe weren't living like that, and they couldn't have that. So therefore, they prevented them from the power of him. And the same applies to many ancient Christians and ancient Catholics and many uh, uh, here, right here in this country, in England. A woman was not allowed to have access to religious scriptures. 
A woman was not allowed to illuminate the illustrations of Christ and his disciples in the books. She was prevented because they knew that knowledge was power. And if there's a small group in class of men who have that knowledge exclusively, they wield the power exclusively. And it's example after example after example after example when it comes to the Muslims today. How many groups and masjids prevent their readers, prevent their, 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 uh, their disciples and their adherents from reading books? Don't listen to this shit. Don't listen to this person. Don't read that book. He's going to fill your hearts with the chuba hat and doubts. No, it's not true. But they're afraid that you're going to come across the haq. You're going to come across the haq. They're afraid that you're going to come across a proof and an evidence that goes against their agenda. So knowledge is power. Power is knowledge. And if you do not seek that power and you don't want to take it, don't get mad and upset when power. And you don't want to take it, don't get mad and upset when a tyrant is in charge of you. When a tyrant is in charge of you. Don't get upset when a tyrant is in charge of you because you have done nothing to stop that tyranny or that tyranny, as we say. So these are some pieces of advice being the night with regards to the month of Ramadan and with regards to fasting, with regards to the month of Ramadan and with regards to fasting. Of course, there's always the advice of being generous with your wealth. There's always the advice that when you cook for your family, cook for your neighbors. There's the advice of, of grooming your daughters and your sons to live in the Ramadan spirit, especially young, your young daughters. They should be taught and they should be educated the importance of preparing the suhoor, of preparing the iftar, of doing it as a family, the barakah of serving people and the honor of serving people in this month. The honor to serve someone and to, 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 to you pr prepare the meals and to make the iftar and to give the suhoor, waking up your family to eat, waking up your family to pray. When your husband leaves the home, this is advice that's not specific to Ramadan, it's to give him advice. As a dhahbi rahimahullah ta'ala quoted one of the women of the salaf, Every morning, before her husband would go outside to the marketplace, she would say, Ittaqillah, She said, Fear Allah, and only bring back lawful wealth. Don't bring back nothing stolen or Ill illicit to feed us. That's what she would tell her husband every morning. So this is very important advice with regards to general life and with regards to life in Ramadan is to take advantage of the things that you have to do. If you're uh, cooking or cleaning, whatever you're doing, listen to classes, listen to lectures, listen to books, make, make istighfar, make tasbih, say subhanAllah as you do things, and groom your children, boys and girls, groom them and raise them upon the Ramadan spirit of serving, of honoring, of being righteous, of being pious. Reward them for fasting half of the day. Reward them for fasting one hour. Reward them for fasting one hour. Reward them for fasting the entire day. Reward them for making the whole taraweeh. My feet hurt. I'm tired. I'm sleepy. Oh, me, I want to go home. I'm tired too. Well, as soon as you finish the tarawih, I'll buy you some, some chocolate or some candy from the store. I'll buy you a new toy. Some, some chocolate or some candy from the store. I'll buy you a new toy. I'll, I'll get you this. Encourage them. I'll, I'll get you this. Encourage them. Raise them. Nurture them upon the virtues of Islam and the virtues of Ramadan. It's very, very, very important for each and every one of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Now we'll leave some time for some questions. If the sisters have any, leave some time for some questions, if the sisters have any, and if they don't have any questions, then we'll take some from the line. What is that from Allah Khaira? Are there any questions? Fight. Fight. Are there any questions, Noor? Yeah, I mean, I'm a hamburger. Class? Yeah, class.